For those of us who are eagerly awaiting the new Let It Be box set, October the 15th can't come soon enough. So in the meantime, let's wind back the clock 51 years and take a look at the original 1970 set, along with some of the other formats and rarities from this album. I'm Andrew from Parlogram Auctions, and welcome to part two of this Let It Be mini-series, the original UK box set, and to a new hat. Less than a month after Paul McCartney's announcement that he was quitting the Beatles, the group released their final studio album on May the 8th, 1970. In the UK, the only way to get hold of it during its first seven months of release was as a deluxe box set. Priced to almost £3, it was double the price of a regular album and is the equivalent to £50 today, or nearly $70. The man behind the design of the box set was legendary album designer John Kosh, whose work over the years included albums such as Hotel California, Who's Next, this classic by the Rolling Stones, and my favourite, Out of the Blue by ELO. Kosh had been invited to become Apple's creative director by John Lennon, who had met Kosh while he was art director for a magazine called Art and Artists. Lennon called him one day wanting to get a flexi inserted into the magazine and this led to a meeting at Apple, after which Lennon asked him, why don't you just find yourself a corner at Apple and start working for us? So at the age of 23, Kosh began designing Apple's album covers for all of their artists, including the Beatles. The most famous of which was Abbey Road, for which he received the magnificent sum of £300. Kosh pulled out all the stops for Let It Be and came up with an elaborate box set design which although looked great, but as you'll know if you've ever owned one, quickly fell apart. The set consisted of two inner components made from thin black card. Firstly, a folded inner tray into which sat the book. This in turn sat inside a larger piece of folded card with outer flaps, which when folded over formed the edges of the set. The album sat inside those flaps too, and then the whole lot was inserted into a fully laminated outer slipcase, which was not an easy task. The whole thing looked amazing, but was extremely fragile. After sliding the trays in and out a few times, the card became creased and tore easily. The frustration of doing this over and over again led to many sets being trashed, and pristine survivors are rare today. The set's catalogue number was PXS1, which was not printed anywhere on the set itself and was used for ordering purposes only. It can, however, be seen on this promotional copy and on this rare 30 by 40 inch EMI promotional poster entitled A Very Special Collection. The poster was issued at the time of the album's release and shows the box set along with all the covers of their previous albums to date, along with contemporary portraits of each Beatle haunting each corner. All of the albums on the poster had their stereo catalogue numbers printed beneath them, although the pictures of the early covers themselves were the mono editions. At the heart of the set was the 11 by 8 inch glossy softback book, which still bore the project's original title, Get Back, printed on its spine. It consisted of 164 glossy pages, containing some superb colour and black and white photographs by Ethan A. Russell which documented the entire project from the Twickenham Film Studios to the rooftop concert. There were also lengthy transcripts from the session, as well as additional text by Rolling Stone magazine writers Jonathan Cott and David Dalton. Early copies of the book omitted the credits on page 7. This was fixed later on some copies by printing them on a separate strip of paper and pasting them in. It was a great book, but it had one major flaw, its binding. It was printed as the rest of the set was by EMI's regular printing company, Garrett and Lofthouse. Books bound in a similar way today are done so using a flexible PUR adhesive. But back in 1970, the printers used a hot melt glue, which once cooled became very brittle. So after opening the book a couple of times, the glue in the spine would crack and the pages would become loose and fall out. Just like that. The album itself came in a high gloss, fully laminated cover 
initially with a red Apple logo on the rear panel. This was changed to a bluish green color a few months later. As I said in the previous video, these green Apple covers also found their way into the box set with a ratio of around three red to one green. By the way, if you love Beatles music and vinyl especially, please subscribe to the channel and click the notification bell icon to make sure you don't miss out on any future content. Thank you. All initial pressings had matrices which ended in the suffix 2U and 99% of all box sets I've ever seen have these matrices. The U suffix indicated that it was cut outside Abbey Road. It was in fact cut at Apple by Malcolm Davis and assisted by George Porky Peckham. The album was recut a few months later with three U matrices, although crossover pressings do exist. The album was eventually issued without the box set on November the 6th, 1970. These all came with green or bluish green Apple logos on the rear and were priced the same as a standard album. Some sets also came with a small folded Apple poster. This showed the label's album output to date, from the White Album to the Modern Jazz Quartet Space in October 1969. These posters were not standard issue items in every set. They were added at point of sale and can be found inside other Apple albums sold at the time, as well as some one EMI box labeled Beatles albums. Let It Be spent three weeks at number one in the UK before being ousted by Simon and Garfunkel's Bridge Over Troubled Water and in total spent 59 weeks in the charts between 1970 and 1973. Although the box set was available in Canada where it retailed for around $10, the US distributors decided not to issue the box set but issued a gatefold version instead. This album had the highest advance orders for any album in the history of the American recording industry at the time, with 3,700,000 orders, so copies are not that rare. However, one of the rarities which did emerge was this single-sided 7-inch 33 and a third promotional disc with 10, 30 and 60 second radio spots. It's very hard to find, especially with its original custom mailer. Box sets eventually began to appear in US stores as imports a year or two later, and some sealed copies still exist today. Some viewers of the last video said that they remembered finding overstocks of Canadian or UK boxes in stores such as Tower in Hollywood for $2.50 in 1972. Let us know in the comments about your memories of finding the box set. Another edition of the album at the top of collector's wants list is the export pressing. This was pressed by EMI in the UK for the few countries in which the Apple label had yet to be registered, which by this point were few and far between. Most of these copies I've seen for sale over the years have come from Portugal. Pressed on its new one EMI box parlophone design, it carried the export catalogue number P PCS 7096. The cover housing it replaced the Apple symbol with the parlophone logo and had the PPCS number on the spine. Due to overproduction of the export covers, these also turned up in UK stores, but with regular Apple labeled discs inside. Copies found in these export covers are usually 2U, 3U crossover pressings. At the time of the album's release, EMI were in the process of ramping up their cassette production, which they'd begun in 1966. Let It Be became only the third album after Sgt. Pepper and Abbey Road to be released on cassette. It came out just a few weeks after the album's release in June 1970, but sadly never as a box set. As with all EMI cassettes at the time, they were duplicated from one inch studio masters with a duplication speed of 32 to one. They were initially housed in the traditional Norelco plastic case with a simple white inlay design. Eagle-eyed viewers will also note that this early cassette inlay misspells I've got a feeling as I got a feeling. The white inlay design was replaced in January 1972 by the dusty gold colored inlays along with an updated white labeled cassette. The final incarnation of the cassette edition appeared as the XDR, Extended Dynamic Range Edition, in 1987, which was sourced from the Digital Masters. The XDR cassettes 
also restored the album's original running order. As with all Beatles albums, and indeed those by many other artists, EMI rearranged the album's running order to fit equally on both sides of the cassette, and to accommodate the complicated programming of the 8-track. The 8-track edition of the album appeared in August 1970, and spread the album across four programmes of equal length. It was manufactured by EMI using a special lubricated tape, which had to be specially imported from the US, and unlike the cassettes, used a duplication ratio of 16 to 1. Whilst the cassette and 8-track formats were just at the start of their journey, another was about to be laid to rest, the reel-to-reel -reel tape. As you may have seen in our other video about the Beatles on Reel to Reel, Let It Be was one of the final batch of titles to be released on this format in August 1970. But unlike its contemporary cassette or 8-track release, the Reel to Reel album was issued in both stereo and mono. Whereas the US Reel to Reel edition played at a healthy 7.5 inches per second, the UK Reel ran at a lowly 3 and 3 quarter inches per second, making it easily the worst sounding edition of the album. Sadly, the mono mix on the UK reel wasn't a dedicated one, but a fold-down of the stereo mix, made by combining the left and right channels into one. As far as value is concerned, those reels are now very hard to find, with mono ones selling for around £500 or $700. Original UK box sets in top condition are highly sought after and are now fetching between £1,000 and £1,500, or between two dollars and $3,000. Lesser condition copies can still be picked up for around £200 or $300, but these are sure to have worn or damaged components. But that's not the problem it once was, for it's now possible to buy replacement components. Both the inner and outer trays and even the poster are available to buy on eBay for reasonable prices. The way to tell the repros and the originals apart is by the colour of the card inside. The originals were grey, but these newly made components are white inside. So if you're buying a set, make sure that it's all original before parting with your money. Clearly, the new Let It Be box set is going to deliver much more than the original 1970 set and will be a good deal sturdier too. Whether it delivers on sound quality is another matter. The original UK 2U and 3U pressings are very similar and have great warmth and presence. The 1978 UK white vinyl cutting is also highly regarded, if you can find one. If you're looking for a better value alternative, most European analogue pressings, i.e. pre-1987, sound sweet and can be picked up for very reasonable prices. The Giles Martin remix on the forthcoming set is bound to ignite heated discussion, and I for one will be posting my review in a future video. I hope you enjoyed looking through this amazing set with me. There'll be one more video in this series before the new set comes out on October the 15th. In the meantime, why not check out some great sounding Beatles vinyl on our website, parlogramauctions.com. But that's it for this one, so I'll say bye for now and thanks for watching.